The old town hall of Manchester, begun in 1821, was a dignified classical building containing a large room for public assemblies, but little in the way of office space. It was hardly an adequate centerpiece for a town that by 1851 had already more than doubled its population to 300,000 and was still growing rapidly. The town was designated a city in 1853, and 10 years later, the council, made up of leaders of local industry, began to discuss the provision of adequate accommodation for the transaction of corporation business. In 1867, the council announced a competition for a new town hall. The designated site was made up of the town's yard and a number of small factories and back-to-back -back houses, together with a few more substantial properties along Princess Street. The worst of the slums had already been cleared to form Albert Square, graced by a newly completed Albert Memorial, leaving the town hall site a thoroughly awkward shape. The instructions, however, were precise. Competing architects were invited to squeeze a public hall, council chamber, reception rooms, committee rooms, offices and a police station onto the triangular space and to provide a grand front and entrance facing Albert Square. From the 137 entries, eight architects were selected to rework their designs. The first place, as a work of art, was awarded to this design by the local firm of Speakman and Charlesworth. Second was John Oldred Scott, eldest son of the famous London architect. Third was Thomas Worthington, designer of the memorial in Albert Square. Fourth, as a work of art, was this design by Alfred Waterhouse. But art was only one of the criteria used, and Waterhouse's work was judged so superior in all aspects of planning, lighting, ventilation and cost that he was given the commission. After which, both architect and patron steadily embellished the design so that it too developed into a work of art, costing over three times the original estimate. embellishment wasn't confined to adding tracery and carving to the facades. It extended to the unseen inner courtyards as well. It's important to remember that the element of display was itself seen as a function of this building. The town hall had to be impressive. It was a demonstration of the city's economic stability and potential for growth. So we can read this classic of its age, both as a building for work and as a celebration of mid-19th century pride in urbanism. A range of great windows at first floor reveal the size of the reception suite. But proudest of all is the 235-foot tower, to which Waterhouse added a further 16 feet as late as 1875. The formal entrance is in the centre of the facade at the base of the tower. The filigree gable, capped with a statue of St George, helps to make it appear larger, although it has to be squeezed under the first floor. At the recessed entry, is the start of a processional route leading to the hall which had few equals in its century for grandeur. From the vestibule, steps lead up to the grand corridor which links all the rooms of the ground floor. But the processional route leads straight across to the grand stair. 
This is dramatically lit from above by tall traceried windows and a large gasolier. Every detail contributes to the theatrical effect. This spiral service stair projecting into the main space is a piece of pure architectural showmanship. From it, we can look down on the open, arcaded landing, and there's another flight of stairs opposite, of matching grandeur. Even the floor of the spacious landing celebrates the industriousness of Manchester with a pattern of busy bees. And so, finally, we come to the Great Hall itself. The competition had required a large hall where the respectable middle classes of Manchester and their visitors might assemble for concerts, balls or political meetings. Most competitors found they needed to place it in the centre of the building, but on the irregular site it's off-centre in relation to the main entrance. Waterhouse showed his skill as a planner in making the axis of his entry lead to one of the grand stairs while a vaulted waiting hall led across to the other. The two flights of the grand stair are thus symmetrical and lead to the central axis of the great hall. And the hall he provided is indeed a fitting end to the processional route. It was designed as symbolising not merely the opulence of the city, but also that great principle of local self-government. At least, that was what the official description said. There's certainly plenty of opulence in the traceried windows, elaborate wrought iron gasoliers, and the huge heraldic ceiling. This represents the main cities and countries with which Manchester was so closely linked in trade. But in the background are the bees again to emphasise Manchester's industry and wealth. Originally, critics felt that all the gold of the ceiling made it too heavy. But Waterhouse and his patrons had always intended that this room should be completed with a set of murals. Added between 1879 and 1892, the paintings are by Ford Maddox Brown, a foremost artist of the day, known for his celebration of honest labour. The series of 12 paintings illustrate historical events chosen by the councillors to enhance the view of 19th century Manchester as the flowering of centuries of progress. The Romans, as bringers of civilization, begin the series. They're shown building their fort at Mancunian. The baptism of Edwin, although it took place in York, stresses the Christian basis of society. The fourth panel depicts the establishment of Flemish weavers in Manchester in 1363. Actually, there was nothing unique to Manchester about Flemish weavers. It's simply an image that underlines the long history of the cloth trade in Manchester. The next reference to manufacture comes in the tenth panel. This picture of Kay, the inventor of the flying shuttle, could be seen as an ambiguous celebration of the cloth trade, since the mob are shown trying to break in and destroy the new invention. It's a nice point whether the council ever intended an image so sympathetic to the labouring classes. But the event, which in any case occurred in Bury, not Manchester, is sanitised by its distance in history, as is the whole of the present state of Manchester. There's curiously little about the developed industrial revolution. Manchester was very much a trading centre, yet the opening of the Bridgewater Canal in 1761 
is the only reference to transport. The final panel shows the Manchester schoolmaster, John Dalton, who died in 1844, collecting marsh fire gas. As the founder of modern chemistry, he does seem worth commemorating. But the rural setting is still a far cry from the reality of the city's power, embodied in mills like this one along the Rochdale Canal. As recently as 1820, it had been possible to portray Manchester in a rural setting. But by the 1860s, the city was so thick with mills that a clear view was only available on Sundays. Still, where there was muck, there was brass. And enough to build mills and warehouses like these. After all, storage and transshipment of goods was as important as manufacture to the city's economy. And the canals, with individual side cuts, brought goods from the mills to the huge warehouses for storage, display, or shipment on to all parts of the world by river and rail. To support this frenzy of business, Manchester had already developed a remarkably complete body of municipal services. So the councillors urgently needed their town hall to house the bureaucracy required to organise these services for a city of over 300,000. The two long sides of the building housed the offices and the committee rooms. The advance and recession of the facades, apart from counteracting the bulk of so huge a building, allowed Waterhouse to produce a whole range of sizes of offices and committee rooms. These look out onto the streets around the town hall. At each of the three corners, there were public entries and stairs, allowing separate access from that provided for gala occasions, while the corridors provide a single unbroken route around the whole building. They're arranged around courtyards whose walls are partly lined with glazed tiles to give extra light in the cramped areas. A good deal of attention was also given to building up a dramatic skyline. The fairy tale outline of Gothic pinnacles, chimneys, dormer windows and towers creates an impression of grandeur and extravagance. This opulence is emphasised by the change in shape and size of the windows on each floor. But it's not all a matter of show. The ground floor office windows are larger to catch more light. And the more elaborate windows indicate the more important rooms. This carved bracket supports the window of the mayor's office. The whole of the rear of the building is given over to municipal bureaucracy with the large public offices on the ground floor for receipt of gas, water and other payments. In spite of the site, Waterhouse actually managed to make most of the offices rectangular, providing fireproof ceilings and designing all the fittings himself. This room, originally the water office, is now the treasurer's department. Like all the offices, it opens onto a wide corridor whose walls are decorated with coloured tiles and patterned terracotta. This one runs the length of the building to the grand corridor that we saw at the front, its great length broken by the fireproof vaulting compartments. At each corner of the triangular site, a wide spiral staircase leads to the upper floors. Polished stone shafts decorate the central well, while an outer arcade with richly carved stone capitals separates the stairway from the passage. And then, beyond, Another corridor leads to the other end of the Grand Corridor. And yet, these corridors aren't just simple passageways. Every alternate bay has a bow window in it that affords convenient waiting or semi-private consultation space. But it's the architect's simple system of these corridors and stairs that's the key to the efficient functioning of this building. It's a large office block that requires easy communication between all departments. And at the midpoint of each corridor, there's an added bonus, 
a cross corridor with a further flight of stairs that meant no office was more than 18 metres from a stairway. Each stair rises the full height of the building to the private floors. These upper corridors have less important offices and so look plainer. There's a clear hierarchy to the organisation of the decoration. The top floor level stairwell, for example, is topped with a rail decorated by beasts' heads. But these are noticeably plainer than those adorning the lamp standards in the first floor council chamber. The lavish decoration is concentrated on the two public floors. Yet even there, it's carefully disposed to demonstrate the greater prestige of the ceremonial part. The grand vestibule sets the tone. Elaborate carving on the composite columns adds to the richness and disguises their size. They are seven feet thick to support the massive weight of the tower. There's a variety of polished stone shafts. And the whole space is covered with a vault that's decorated with carving and glass mosaic in grey, black and gold. The office corridors have painted decoration on their fireproof vaults. There's a different pattern for each corridor, though it's not certain whether this is to identify them or just for variety. Different colours of terracotta cladding on the walls distinguish the first floor from the ground floor. This terracotta was easily moulded to a whole range of patterns. Low relief on the walls and high relief on the vaulting ribs. There's variety too of the sort Ruskin would have approved in the carved stone capitals. No two are the same. And the floors are set with a mosaic of symbolic cotton flowers, an explicit reference to the chief source of Manchester's wealth. And significantly, in the Grand Corridor, the cotton flowers are richer. Although the use of similar materials emphasises the unity of the building, there's a clear demarcation line between the ceremonial and office corridors. Being less grand than the public rooms, the offices themselves didn't need to be so tall, so Waterhouse could fit more floors in. But at first floor level, where the reception rooms and Grand Corridor rise through one and a half storeys, there's real ingenuity in the linking of the two parts. The upper floors of offices are on split levels, with the end of the lower second floor corridor marked by this open iron screen. Then, the corner of the ceremonial block is turned by a dramatic and complex vault in which both the ribs and the banded stonework emphasize the movement round the corner. Then the spiral stairs give easy access to all the different landings. And this imaginative solution to a complex planning problem is part of the architectural success of this building that had to function on such different levels. At this corner, Waterhouse set the council chamber, where ceremonial and municipal functions meet. In his first competition entry, he'd put it at the far end of the building. But for the second competition, the council required that it be set on the grand façade as a proper expression of civic pride. After all, this was the formal centrepiece of municipal democracy in Manchester. And so, the whole room is decorated with appropriate civic pride as well. The large windows facing Albert Square are fitted with stained glass in special pale tones so as not to darken the room. There's a massive stone fireplace in the Gothic style, decorated with blue and white tiles of a more modern, almost classical style. The walls are decorated with coats of arms of neighboring Lancashire boroughs, set in a frieze of cotton plants. And it's these cotton plants and the bees of Manchester's crest that symbolize the reality of the city's power through its trade. And the profits of that trade from Manchester's point of view, were considerable. And ample justification for this palatial building costing nearly a million pounds. The pride in wealth of those this building primarily served is evident in the lavish gilt dinner service presented to the town hall by a group of local worthies. It cost them around 7,000 pounds, though it does appear that some 3,000 of that actually came from the town hall account. It too is decorated with cotton plants in bud, 
flower and fruit, and commemorates the powerful businessmen like Abel Hayward, who saw to the achieving of this whole grand edifice. Hayward was mayor in 1867 when the competition was announced, and re-elected for the opening ten years later, an event the whole city celebrated, with trades processions, banquets, and commemorative broadsheets such as this. The council chamber was the first of the four grand rooms arranged en suite along the facade. Beyond the mayor's parlour is the reception room, which leads in turn to the banqueting hall. All the rooms were lavishly equipped with fittings and furniture designed or approved by Waterhouse. of building, you can trace a stylistic development from the Gothic of the windows to the aesthetic movement's fascination with sunflowers, which you see in these original curtains of the banqueting hall. These were possibly designed by Princess Louise, but they reappear in the built-in sideboard designed by Alfred Waterhouse. Yet it seems to me that this stylistic development is perhaps less interesting than the way in which fabrics, woodwork, metal and paint all combine to create a rich unity that nicely complements the spatial complexity of this room. This oriel window appears to be one side of the far end of a room that runs along the grand facade. In actual fact, the window opens onto the angle of the building, which Waterhouse has treated as a little facade on its own. The other window is on the Princess Street front, where the offices are. It's another ingenious junction between the ceremonial and municipal at the most visible corner of King Cotton's Palace. Waterhouse had managed to devise a single huge building to house an efficient bureaucracy. Yet the lavish decoration and dramatic quality of the architecture combine with its practical functions to make this town hall a monument of the greatness of Manchester cooperation. In his speech at the opening, Abel Hayward went on to claim it had been reared not because Manchester desired a large, a handsome or a noble building, but because the interests of the citizens required its erection. The building's sheer bulk and conspicuous opulence was evidently seen by the citizens who had it built as entirely appropriate for the figurehead of their confident Victorian city. <laughs> 